Good morning. Welcome to the Humanist Community in Silicon Valley Sunday Forum. My name is Matt Courtney and I'm a, the recorder and member of the board of the Humanist Community. The Humanist Community is a chapter of the American Humanist Association. Humanism is a reality-based philosophy of life that affirms our ability and responsibility to lead ethical lives of personal fulfillment that aspire to the greater good. We value freedom, health, happiness, fairness, compassion, and using science and reason to acquire and apply knowledge. If these words describe your thinking, we invite you to become a member of the humanist community if you've not already done so. Membership forms are available on our website at humanist.org. If you are listening for the first time, welcome, and we invite you to continue listening to our weekly forums and other events. You can find all our events listed on the website humanist.org. Please aid us in continuing to present these forums by donating to the Humanist Community. You can find out how to donate to our organization on the website, again, humanist.org. Our speaker today is Louise Bruce, uh, who will talk on zero, the Zero Replaced and Recycling Director of San Jose uh, Conservation Corps. Hope I got that all right, Core. Uh, Go ahead, Louise. You should be able to unmute yourself and. All right, I'm just going to go ahead and share. Yeah. Um, while I'm getting that going, thank you all for um, inviting me and the core, um, more specifically, to, to be a part of your forum. We're really grateful um, for opportunities to share the great work that our, our core members are doing. Um, just a quick kind of intro to me. I am, my name is um, well, Louise, as you know, um, and I am the director of zero waste and emergency um, services at the core. What, so I oversee kind of both of our um, zero waste programming and then our response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so I'll focus the presentation primarily on zero waste, but I will also get into a little bit about how we've mobilized um, in the context of COVID. Um, and uh, sort of closer to the end of the presentation, I'm happy to, to discuss either of those areas um, when we get to the discussion point. I also just, I don't mind being interrupted. I don't know um, how things typically flow. I don't mind being interrupted at all. So feel free, you know, if I'm going too fast or too slow through some of this content, um, feel free to let me know either through the chat box or um, by just, uh, uh, you know, raising your hand and diving in. Um, uh, Absolutely fine with me. Um, so just to um, just to start things off, um, just sort of what is the San Jose Conservation Corps? So I'm curious. I don't know if there if we can do a show of hands, but how many folks have heard of San Jose's Conservation Corps before? Okay, so one, maybe one, maybe a couple <laughs> more. Um, so we are um, we are one of 14 local conservation corps that are distributed across the state. They um, go, we have, I think the most southernmost core is in San Diego, and then we stretch all the way up um, into the sort of North Bay and then Sacramento area. Um, we're independent organizations, but we have a very strong um, relationship to one another and, and deeply collaborate uh, as most of our missions kind of focus around the, two, the same core areas. Um, but most centrally, we're focused on providing what we refer to as t transition age youth. So young adults um, between the ages of 18 and 27 in our case, that, that age range can range a little bit um, depending on the core, um, but with high quality education, work experience um, and opportunities to empower them to be become responsible, productive and caring citizens. So, um, so while we do work on zero waste, on emergency operations, on natural resources management, the real core of what we do is is all about um, our trainees, our core members, as we refer to them. There is also, I should mention, there is also the California Conservation Corps, which is, um, again, another kind of affiliated um, agency that uh, similarly has um, bases throughout the state, and they do similar work to us, but they tend to be, not, not exclusively, but tend to do more kind of um, work in rural areas, where the, whereas the local conservation corps, many of them are in more urban areas. Um, but, you know, we still, again, deeply collaborate. So why do we do this work? What challenges are we seeking to address? Um, I really, so for, for my um, vantage point, we really have this very strong two-prong um, uh, mission. And the first is about um, addressing, or sort of the first prong is about addressing the very um, significant um, 
sort of issues of inequality and poverty in East San Jose. Um, so I won't necessarily dive into any of these statistics too closely other than to say that um, if, you, if you've lived in Silicon Valley or, or San Jose, you may, you may be very well aware of sort of the inequality um, across the city. So in East San Jose, where, where one of our campuses is and where we're really focused, um, Poverty rates are higher, um, fewer residents attain high school diplomas, which then can you know, influence whether or not they're able to achieve employment. Um, unemployment rates are um, where our, in the areas where our, our students and core members typically reside are substantially higher than the um, sort of average as a whole. And then even kind of sort of down the line, um, we see really great inequality when it comes to um, uh, sort of salaries um, across uh, uh, ethnic and, and um, sort, of, sort of, well, actually I'll read this specifically. Um, uh, I find this really staggering that um, per capita income for Hispanics and Latinos in San Jose is vastly outpaced by their white counterparts with an average of 24,574 as compared to 73,000 um, for white residents of Silicon Valley. So really kind of extraordinary um, income inequality. Um, and that's sort of so first and foremost, what we're very focused on addressing. <coughs> Sorry, I'm a little bit stuffy. Um, so the other thing that I that's been really um, on the rise for young adults um, in the area is homelessness and housing insecurity. So um, I was very um, surprised to learn I joined the core about a year and a half ago. Um, and I was very, very surprised to learn that the fastest growing segment of our unhoused population is transition age young adults. So that that group, that 20, you know, the 18 to 24 year olds um, that I mentioned. And part of this is, is because it's a really invisible phenomenon. So a lot of times sort of you, you can see um, homelessness or the sort of experience of homelessness you might kind of notice among sort of older populations, but young adults, they might be um, couch surfing or um, staying in, you know, sleeping in their cars. Other, there's sort of an invisibility um, to homelessness at those younger ages. Um, and this is, this is a crisis really that is only being exacerbated by COVID-19. So, um, so as you can imagine, we've, we're seeing a lot more of our um, young adults who've lost employment or are experiencing reduced hours um, while at the same time their, their sort of financial responsibilities are increasing. So on, a, on the total kind of other side of, of where we're focused on, on the zero waste side, um, we see enormous opportunity in piles like this one that you have pictured here. So um, uh, as you're, I think, probably um, maybe aware, um, Californians landfill approximately 30 million tons of waste each year. Um, that waste infrastructure is disproportionately located in disadvantaged communities, um, which ultimately then bear the burden of all of the externalities that come with that. So that could be um, truck traffic, noise, odors. The big one that um, is really is startling and you're, you're seeing a lot more studies around this is just the rates of asthma um, as a result of, of air pollution. Um, so not only are we, are we throwing all this material away, um, but it's, we're, we're doing that in, in the communities that um, sort, of, sort of our poorest communities are bearing the burden of that. Um, and then sort of, for me, as someone who's worked in, in trash and in the waste management field for quite a long time, um, what I, um, you know, sort of what excites, what suppose excites me actually, is that this is a tremendous amount of lost resources. So um, I know everyone knows this when we think about the importance of recycling, but it's still happening at really staggering rates. We are using materials, once we've decided that they're no longer usable, putting them into this system that, that's very linear that then takes them and either incinerates or landfills that material and makes it totally inaccessible for us. At the same time, on the other end, we're, um, we're you know, sort of seeing this decreasing availability of finite resources. Um, and so there's just a huge opportunity to take that linear process and make it circular. Just to take one example, food waste, which is, um, really uh, uh, sort of near and dear to me. It's something I, an issue I've worked on for a long time. Um, Californians throw away um, nearly 6 million tons of food each year. Um, meanwhile, we see that over 4 million people are struggling with hunger um, and, and many of them are children. Um, in terms of putting that in sort of a dollar value on that, um, we would need uh, 
two billion more dollars um, to meet that kind of food gap, right? So we're throwing all this material away. Much of it is perfectly edible. Um, and then on the other hand, um, we have this huge sort of gap um, in terms of meeting the, the or sort of stabilizing hunger in California. Um, and then in the United States, just um, to kind of think of, to, to put a number on what, um, what it is to lose that material to the landfill, um, food waste accounts for 18% so the food that is wasted accounts for 18% of cropland, 19% of fertilizer, 21% of fresh water, um, and 5% of greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. So, so it's like we're putting all these resources into this material that we throw away. And this is true for every, every whether it's your, um, your electronics, your plastics, what, you know, any other material, um, food waste is just one example. We put all these resources in, we put, um, which, you know, account for real, um, sort of substantial portions of our of our um, uh, food system in this case, um, and then we're just kind of chucking that into landfills. So, what's our solution to these these challenges? Um, we so we we're, we've been in existence now for for about thirty three years, um, and the idea behind the cores is sort of we have these sort of three pillars. Um, the first is that we create a space for stabilization. So. Um, a lot of our young adults, um, not exclusively, we have a really diverse group, but a lot of our young adults are experience sort of what we see as systemic barriers to employment. That could be, um, you know, the, the, the phenomenon of being pushed out of high school um, and not achieving your high school diploma. That could be um, homelessness, which I mentioned is, is certainly we're seeing on the rise. Um, it could be a whole host of, it could be that you're a young parent or a whole host of other um, challenges that make it very difficult for you to go straight into kind of like a, a traditional employment pathway. Um, and so we have a sort of a very individualized uh, program that, that provides wraparound services. Um, and then we uh, create the space, I think, which is most important um, from my perspective, just like having that foundation, that space to figure out what are the services I need? How do I, how do I connect in with them? Um, how do I get, you know, sort of access to the mentorship and counseling I might need um, so that I can start to um, show up on time and really engage in my work? Um, the other piece um, that, we, that we provide is um, we do have a, a, an affiliated charter school uh, that through which um, our uh, core members can finish their high school diploma if they um, don't have one already. Um, so you can be co-enrolled in our job program and in our high school. Um, and then the third pillar, which is um, where I'm very focused, which is our paid job training program. So we do um, sort of on average, this, it varies, uh, but core members are with us for about a year um, during which they can um, participate in a variety of different tracks, um, really be mentored by our supervisors, um, receive kind of uh, both hard and soft skill um, job training, and then um, and then sort of hopefully that becomes sort of a springboard onto their next step. Any questions at this stage? No. Okay. So as I mentioned, we've been doing this work for um, for more than thirty years, um, and a big part of that uh, was sort of initially spurred on by the the bottle bill. So for those of you who've been watching um, beverage container recycling in the state. Um, the cores played a very uh, significant role in the very early days of that, um, collecting beverage containers, sorting them, um, and, uh, and that's sort of where the core funding came from initially. Um, this is what our, what our warehouse used to look like. Um, so very, you would see a sort line um, with core members. Um, I dug out this, this photo out of the archives, um, which is just, you know, kind of really gives you a sense of what things used to look like with the cores and how we leveraged this initial opportunity to create jobs. Um, now we've expanded um, the, um, so I know Carl said, we don't take everything. That's definitely true. Um, we're not a, a recycling center in the sense of um, kind of a place where you can bring any materials, um, but we have really expanded our portfolio of focus to include all of, all of the materials you see here, um, uh, plus a little bit more that I'll talk about. Um, so we have a mattress program. Um, we're really working on how we can engage in the food waste space with a lot of the new legislation that's coming down the pipeline. Um, electronic waste have, has been um, kind of a core of our work for the past several years, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so we're really trying to think about how we can go from being kind of a, a sort of 
specific commodity focused um, enterprise to really being um, uh, focused on zero waste and achieving a kind of larger um, uh, portfolio of recycling services. Um, so, so this work is primarily done though through partnerships. So um, we, uh, oh, sort of some reasons why um, local jurisdictions and, and companies and nonprofits might partner with us um, include that we have this 30 year history of recycling operations, um, that we have this ability, and I'll get into this really with emergency operations, we have this ability to mobilize very rapidly um, and, and sort of fill gaps and needs that might um, come up. We are very interested as an organization in testing innovative pilot, what I call, kind of call boutique uh, waste management programs. Um, so I'll get to that in a little bit, some examples. Um, and sort of, you know, going back to this core mission, um, we're really able to um, tailor our training to meet our partner's needs. So for instance, a partner could both work with us on a project or they could be an employer on the other end. Um, so for our core members, so we can really work closely with them to say, okay, what are the gaps that your organization might have um, for your, your sort of entry level employees and how can we get our core members to, um, to that place um, so that they, so they can be kind of your future workforce in addition to piloting kind of in real time now. Um, we, there's sort of another number of other things here, but, the, but really, you know, um, the other thing is just bringing diversity to um, an, an industry that um, historically has not been um, diverse at, at all. Um, so really trying to think about how we use the core as sort of an entry, um, pat, sort of a, a, an opportunity for the waste management industry to sort of diversify and, and same thing for um, our other various um, pathways. So what are some examples of partnership? Any, I'll just pause here. Any questions at this stage or? Uh, you can raise your hand if you have any questions. We do have a, a quick one in the chat, which I think is actually already uh, answered, but just to verify, uh, you mentioned GHG gas or emissions in uh, one of the slides. Does that mean greenhouse gas? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so That's sorry right. about that. Sorry for any acronyms. Um, Definitely stop me if I'm using an acronym that um, is, is not familiar. Uh, yeah, so it's greenhouse gas emissions. Um, okay. That was earlier. That was earlier. Yeah, it was answered in the, the chat uh, we, from us guessing. But okay, so it looks like Carl has a question. So I'll ask him to unmute. Okay, yeah, I, I just, you know, for those of us who are unfamiliar with these rules, I'm sure you deal with it all the time. Proposition 68 and Proposition 1, what do they entail? So, oh, so Prop, Prop 68, um, and this is very, um, this is, so uh, the, I'll just reference here shortly, or sort of briefly that um, the core, we um, do a lot of, a lot of our work happens through government funding. Um, so sometimes we partner with, with um, uh, corporations or, you know, in some cases, um, private entities might contract with us, but the vast majority of what we do um, is contracted with local jurisdictions or um, the state government. Um, and so Proposition 68 that's referred to here um, uh, is focused on um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and uh, food waste and other kind of environmental work. It's actually um, now, it's, it's sort of a, pro a, a bond. Um, so it's bond funding that was passed several years ago. I can't recall exactly what year um, that um, allocates funding for um, work around um, natural resources management, um, parks. So there's a sort of the next um, grant cycle for that is up right now. And um, there's a, a lot of funding there for, um, for uh, new construction or rehabilitation of, um, of public parks. Um, but we also used it for um, building some of our organic waste um, infrastructure. So the idea basically is that um, sometimes with, this, with bond funding, so for Prop 68 and Prop 1, which are both natural resources focused um, propositions that were voted on, you know, um, those uh, so occasionally what will get written in is that um, to be able to qualify or to participate that you, they sort of, you can get extra points on your application if you, part if you collaborate with a core. Um, and so, uh, so that's what's sort of being referenced here is that um, when, we, when we give this talk to uh, municipal partners or potential jurisdictions that we're gonna work with, um, we just let them know that if they're thinking about say 
um, doing work in, in a local park that um, by partnering with us, they can kind of increase the, the likelihood that their application will be accepted. Does that make sense? I know I also referenced SB 1383, um, which uh, is legislation coming down the pipeline right now. Um, very, very fast and furious around um, food waste and organic waste. So um, that uh, what essentially that will require local jurisdictions to ensure that food waste doesn't go to landfills. Um, but also, which is very exciting, that 20% that that all jurisdictions increase their um, recovery of edible food by 20%. Um, so there's just a lot of um, opportunity there for um, cores to support that work. Um, and it's something that we're thinking about very deeply now and I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, but absolutely, um, some of these things like you start to get into acronym land um, for us. So definitely if I do that again, um, absolutely feel free to stop me. Um, so, so is that everything for any other questions at this stage? Good, okay. Um, so some examples of what, what partnership looks like. So just to, to kind of um, uh, reiterate that we, um, so we hire our core members, they come in, um, they're, they're, they go through training and stuff with us in the house, but the vast majority of the work that we do um, is through um, partnerships. Uh, so our core members might be um, then placed with another organization or working on our behalf with another organization. So I'll just show you kind of what that looks like. Um, so the first is CalRecycle. Is everyone familiar with CalRecycle, the, the government agency focused on recycling? Okay, so they're a state agency that's focused on um, recycling and um, resource management, um, and so across the state of California. Um, and they have uh, funded the cores um, pretty consistently for about 30 years uh, to do work around recycling. Um, so these are two, the two of our core members, Marissa and Israel, um, who are working on tires here. Um, because uh, the CalRecycle funding really focuses on key, four key areas. So um, we started partnering with CalRecycle um, many, many years ago on beverage containers, as I mentioned. Um, and then sort of more recently, I think about five years ago, that portfolio was expanded to include tires, used oil, and electronics. So with um, tires and electronics, we actually do collection um, of those materials and then ensure that they go to recycling. With used oil, we're very focused on outreach. So making sure, for instance, um, that uh, that boating op boat operators um, at marinas know how to properly dispose of any used oil, um, that uh, residents have the information that they might need. Uh, so we do events where you know we might collect tires and and e waste, but we're also doing that outreach and education around used oil. We have another program um, called Zero Waste Eastside, uh, which is a partnership with um, Eastside Union High School District, our local um, high school district, which I'm told, I believe, is the largest high school district in Northern California. It's in East San Jose. Um, and we manage all of the waste and recycling for uh, their 17 campuses. Uh, so it might look like that. This is just sort of an example. Um, we've worked with them to go from, um, let's see if I have it here. Well, um, we worked with them to, at the very start when they had absolutely no recycling um, separation to um, bring them up and in, into compliance uh, with, with various kind of new laws. Um, and so, it, you know, if you were to go visit any of their campuses, you might see a setup like this where you have um, the different bins uh, for collecting different materials. And as you can imagine, it doesn't just kind of involve setting up that infrastructure on the back end, but then we also work internally with the schools um, to do education and outreach and engage various stakeholders to kind of increase the participation in these programs. Um, this is something, this is some sort of uh, like a sort of mini social enterprise that we've started and we actually would really love to grow this program to provide um, recycling at this, this scale for um, uh, schools, colleges, um, and other kind of agencies or institutions that might um, benefit from this support. Uh, this is, I like to show this, this picture. This is um, one load of trash from, from one of the schools um, or from, you know, sort of a route um, at, from all those schools, campuses. Um, and I just, I love to show this picture because it just, again, is like this idea of how much opportunity there is in the waste stream. So if you look closely, um, you can see leaves, you can see beverage containers, you can see all kinds of materials that are otherwise recyclable. And it just kind of gets at what this challenge is. So it's really, um, 
uh, I was just talking to someone yesterday who was um, looking at data with with folks around recycling and how ever you know most people think that they are recycling well, um, which which shows sort of good faith and, and kind of buy into recycling systems. Um, but the reality is is that it's so complicated making sure that um, figuring out what materials go where and making sure that they get to the right place that um, still we have a tremendous amount of very kind of valuable resources ending up um, in piles like these. So this is our challenge. Um, this graph shows how we've worked with them over time um, uh, to increase their what we call their diversion rate. So the rate at which they're taking materials out of the trash and putting them into the appropriate um, kind of bin. So starting really from essentially a zero percent recycling rate and then bringing them up to um, closer to 70 um, is, is where we're working. Our goal is to get to 90%, which is zero waste to landfills. Um, and we're, you know, sort of on our way there, um, but not quite there yet. Uh, a big part of this is, is SB 1383, um, as I mentioned. So this legislation that's going to require um, that uh, food waste is diverted from all major generators, generators meaning like, you know, those that generate um, waste. And so uh, we're also working very closely to think about how do we pilot and roll out um, food waste in the kitchen. So these are two of our core members, Linda and Marquise in a, one of the school kitchens, working with kitchen staff on um, how to separate out those materials. Um, I, I referenced earlier this idea of like boutique or um, uh, sort of like more specific pilots with um, local jurisdictions. So in the case of Sunnyvale, um, a few years ago, we started talking to their um, De Department of Environmental Services about a challenge that they had around glass. So um, they have, you know, glass ends up being a contaminant in both kind of the wet, the wet streams, the organics, um, and then also the dry stream as it breaks, um, you know, and can end up, uh, it can be really, really hard to separate out from other materials. And so what we've set up with them is this, this route where we um, collect glass and other beverage container material from, um, now it's about 85 businesses in Sunnyvale. Um, but what I really think is very neat about this program is that a lot of haulers, so like, you know, sort of the big scale operators of waste collection um, might not have capacity to do kind of these more um, sort of smaller scale specific programs. And so um, that's where we come in. We're really not, um, interested in competing with them, but rather complementing their work so that we can collectively as an industry um, get to zero waste. Uh, this is what our mattress recycling program looks like. Um, and I like to call this one out because it's a really, um, there's a lot of great sort of peripheral skills that our core members learn as a result of participating in this. Um, so we do about um, 470,000 pounds of mattresses every um, quarter. Um, so it's a, it's a tremendous number, many, I think it's about 8,000 mattresses um, uh, in a, a given three month period. Um, and that's a program that's growing. Um, and so for each and every one of those mattresses, if you can imagine lifting a single mattress can be a challenge, but our core members are um, thinking about how to efficiently move them, um, organize them, and then load them into containers so that they can go to the proper recycling. Um, facility. And so there's a lot of kind of um, facility management, uh, uh, forklift skills, et cetera, that they learn as a result of this program. Um, so another um, big effort that we're making this year is we pr provide monthly um, what we call amnesty events for e-waste and waste tires. We're also actually beginning to loop mattresses into that process. Um, and so if you come to our campus on a monthly basis, we will um, uh, you can actually come any day of the week, but you can also come on the on the weekends um, uh, once a month, um, and it's a drive-through, contact-free. Um, so this, the the pictures you see here are pre-COVID, um, but now in the context of COVID, um, we're able to do this process contact-free, where you put your materials in your trunk, you drive onto our campus, our core members will unload the materials, get it sorted, make sure it goes to recycling, um, and then you'll you can just be on your way. Um, and then. Um, Lastly, I think for just for the purposes of this presentation, another um, big area of work that we do is, is um, training around outreach and sort of being a public representative. And so our, um, this, is, this is just an example where our core members work with the city of Cupertino to operate their compost distribution program. So if there's any Cupertino residents on here who've been to pick up um, compost at the compost site, um, you've probably met some of our core members who um, are there on Friday and Saturday mornings um, to help distribute compost and um, keep track of data uh, for the city of Cupertino. 
So, you know, just coming back to kind of full circle to why we do this work. So of course, um, you know, uh, especially, you know, for folks like me who, who love recycling and love thinking about recycling systems and zero waste, um, you know, we have a very strong environmental focus uh, and, and we really want to make sure that our core members are kind of really pushing um, forward on, on climate change mitigation and sort of other areas. We have another, a number of new um, programs in the works around food waste where we're going to be doing a lot more with composting. Um, but really coming back to sort of why we do this, we do this not to be kind of as big as other operate, you know, other recycling centers or compete with them, but really rather um, because we are focused on training the next generation of zero waste professionals. Um, so really creating an opportunity for our core members to go on to living wage jobs um, in the zero waste world or elsewhere, um, where they can bring kind of their the passion that they've developed, the knowledge that they've developed around this issue um, to uh, either to the industry or to other areas. Um, and I like to just kind of show. Um, these images just because they sort of keep me inspired. I think up until, you know, or sort of what we're very focused on now is kind of, okay, we've, we've been operating in the context of these traditional priorities, reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, but what can we, how can the, you know, then sort of when we talk about this next generation of zero waste, it's really going to look different. And so we're trying to kind of open our, our minds and, and think as an organization about, okay, so how do we engage not only in these traditional areas, which still remain critically important, um, but also um, start to get into um, this idea of redesigning or reimagining systems. So um, can we help cities, jurisdictions, companies, et cetera, pilot um, new ways of, of managing materials that get at this idea of circular economy? Um, this is just a, a overly technical graph that um, uh, really is just to show that um, instead of having this, going back to kind of what I said at the beginning, which is instead of having this very linear pathway for materials use, from kind of, uh, you know, pulling out the resources, you know, and raw materials, creating a product, consuming the product, and then disposing of the product, and then never kind of seeing it again. How can we pull that around and create a circle? And so compost is probably one of the most sort of clear circles there, but um, but I think there's there's sort of thought happening across many industries and like how, what does it really mean to build a circular, what's known as a circular economy? Um, how do we, um, how can we pull these materials back into production or back into use? Um, and for us at the core is that that creates a whole lot of jobs. And so how are we either plugging in kind of and creating um, our own central social enterprises around that work or how are we training our core members um, to go on to be able to take on uh, the new roles, the new uh, kind of jobs that will be created as a result of this movement um, to a circular economy. So um, I'm gonna actually pivot um, at this um, stage over to our COVID-19 response just very briefly. Um, we, uh, on I think just like everyone uh, about a year ago, or well, actually exactly a year ago, um, we were uh, really not sure um, what was going to happen in the context of COVID for our core members. Um, we, we were trying to think, be creative, do online training, um, kind of try to figure things out. Um, but we didn't know, just like everyone, how to operate safely, what we should operate, um, and if we were actually going to be able to continue um, or, or have to shut down. And I think what was sort of most scary about that is that many of our core members are um, if not the sing, you know, sort of primary earner for their household, um, they are certainly um, sort of a key earner for their for their families, um, and and that their kind of ability to have a job and stability with the core was really central to their um, to their sort of livelihood. And so this was going to be a really dramatic change for our um, for our team. Um, we uh, were very lucky, though, um, to be activated. Uh, by the um, by the governor um, and then by our uh, the, the county of Santa Clara and the city of San Jose to participate in really substantial emergency response, which at the start, I think we were we thought, okay, well, maybe this will be, um, you know, a two to three week deployment or, you know, we'll go help out for, you know, maybe, maybe two months um, and then this will all be over. Um, but now actually a year in, we've grown our team um, threefold um, and have been been working in a number of areas that I'll talk about in a second. Um, now for a year, which is pretty wild. 
so the, the two things that initially we were asked to help staff homeless shelters 24-7. Um, so we operate, we went from being kind of this 8 to 4.30 operation to being a 24-7 operation. Um, we, at our peak, had, um, we're helping at nine um, homeless shelters um, or uh, what we call um, isolation shelters, where folks who either had um, contracted COVID-19 or who were exposed to COVID-19 um, were able to isolate. So the motel programs that you're hearing about. Um, we, so uh, we've now been doing that work for exactly a year. We're gonna celebrate our anniversary next week. Um, and, um, and then a little bit later, as the National Guard was being pulled out of the food banks, um, we were uh, asked to, to kind of build a team that could help box food um, and today we have over 100 um, staff and core members deployed to food banks on a daily basis uh, to, uh, to box food for um, what, what is, I think, so essentially food hunger in the area doubled. Um, so you may have heard this or read this about Second Harvest that um, I think before the pandemic, they had about 250,000 um, people who uh, requested food on a monthly basis. And now it's well, it's sort of um, over half a million. And so our core was able to help um, bridge that gap. Um, so I'll just show you some some pictures of what that looks like. Um, these are very old stats actually. Just in February alone, the team did 5.5 million pounds of food um, uh, for, you know, I think on average it's about um, sort of half a million people who are um, receiving food from the food banks on a monthly basis. Um, and then these are, this is what sort of our 24-7 shelter operation looks like, um, where we've seen our core members get really engaged in um, homeless services, in case management, um, in just generally providing support for those who've been vulnerable or um, you know, required additional support in the context of COVID. Um, it's been really an extraordinary experience. We've already had 15, maybe actually maybe getting close to 20 core members who have been hired full-time into social services operations. Um, so um, by our partners, we'll be, um, we have you know, one, one core member um, at last week um, is taking on the role of um, employment specialist with one of our partners, Life Moves. And we're just, it's just so exciting to see that kind of full circle um, opportunity come out of the pandemic. It's really been a silver lining um, for us. So I will, I'll kind of leave it there, um, but really just want to say that um, one, we're very grateful for the opportunity to talk about this work. We've grown tremendously. Um, over the past, uh, you know, 18 months, and we're um, really seeing a, a lot of opportunity um, to partner, um, to participate in our programs, um, and so much more. So um, if there's anything, anything I can answer at this point, or if you'd like to follow up with me afterwards, I put my contact information here, um, because we'd love to talk about how we can, you know, partner, support you, um, or provide some of the recycling services that you might need. All right. Uh, Carl already has his hand up. Uh, hopefully you can unmute. I think I got him. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Um, great presentation. Uh, I sort of went through your website, but I can see it's somewhat different than I originally thought. Let me, um, yeah, so, so, you know, I had a couple of questions, you know, Sunnyvale is really apparently out there. Uh, much of the consternation is some of the people in Sunnyvale, especially about food recycling at, at the home level. And I don't want to get into all the difficulties. It's because they took away a third of our garbage can in order to use it. And, and it was, a, I think it was a patently stupid idea, but a generalized concept is fine. But, um, you know, for some reason, recently, you get a box and it says recycle on the box or it's you know, plastic. It says it's recyclable. Unfortunately, Sunnyvale just throws it in the garbage. So the question is, what's causing that, that you, that you have to throw away stuff that's clearly theoretically been designed to be recycled? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, I think, Carl, that's like the question, right, with the recycling industry. I think... Um, that's so confusing um, and, and where I think there is a lot of really great work going on. Um, but I think from the sort of resident experience, it still remains confusing, right? So I, I um, what I like to kind of, um, uh, which maybe you're very aware of, but what I like to kind of sort of point to in, in um, response to questions like these is that 
recycling, so landfilling is very much this process of like take everything and put it in a hole, right? Or take everything in an incinerator. It's very much focused on the consumer, right? Like what do we, what do we need to get out of um, someone's home or whatever? Um, in the case of recycling, recycling really only works um, if there's a market on the other end, right? So it's just like, it's very volatile. Well, something I, I worked a long time for the city of New York um, on recycling. And I was so, it was so interesting to me when I first joined to learn that, um, that not only is it like, does there have to be a market on the other end, but it's super dynamic, right? So today there could be, um, I remember one of my orientation videos, they were like, you know, on some days there's like, you know, real demand for orange tide bottles, you know, the, or the plastic specifically in, in that's at that grade, but also kind of that color. Um, and so, um, so the sort line in, at our facility in New York could actually kind of sort out for these specific materials. Um, and so it's just like, kind of like the stock market, or if you think about like, you know, that, um, the, the ability to recycle something isn't inherent in the product itself, but rather in whether or not there's someone creating other products that use that material, right? And so, and that can be consistent demand for some products. And that's why they talk about sort of the recyclability of something being very, very high. Um, aluminum is like my favorite aluminum. Um, not only is there a lot of demand for aluminum, but also aluminum can become an, become exactly what it was, right? So um, an aluminum can equals an aluminum can. Um, whereas um, other plastics, you're kind of constantly in this cycle of downgrading. So it's not just like, you know, can Tide, to go back to the Tide example, and, and, and I may be a little bit wrong about this specific one, but the, because um, I don't know the, the ins and outs of um, sort of Tide's production processes, but like if you, like that, that plastic bottle can't necessarily become 100% the same product that it was before just because of how the material works. So, um, so it's a sort of highly complicated system where um, cities um, have different capacities or jurisdictions have different capacities to um, take that material, turn it into a raw material that then is um, desirable by a manufacturer or producer on the other end. Um, and then that manufacturer or producer has to have consistent demand um, for something to be always recyclable. Now cities like, so um, so cities like probably Sunnyvale is thinking about like, they're trying to make that as not confusing for you as possible, right? So they're thinking like, if I had to, you know, have a dashboard where, that my residents check every day to determine whether or not something is recyclable, that would never work. Um, so what they try to do is almost like this, like sort of guessing of like, okay, you know, this is the listing of materials that, you know, majority of the time we're going to be able to find a market for. Um, but there might be materials that Sunnyvale struggles to um, actually find a market for on the other end. The other piece of this is also sort of the process through which um, sort of how sophisticated the facility is. The smart station in Sunnyvale is pretty, is a pretty sophisticated operation. Um, but, you know, you go to like uh, sort of more rural towns and they have a much smaller recycling center where everything is manually separated. Um, and so what materials are easy to separate out, but also what materials um, might cause contamination. Um, so like the big thing with plastic bags, I know here, which is very cool, we could never pull it off in New York. Um, but you see a lot of cities here have linerless recycling. So they, they really push you not to have the bag. Um, plastic bags as like a container are great um, from an efficiency perspective of like pulling it out of your house and putting it in the bin. So from a collection perspective, it's a really um, kind of great tool. But then when you get to the facility and the machines have to rip open these bags, um, that can become a huge, huge contaminant um, for the, um, for the system. So I think that's kind of a lot of, sort of a long way to say, to say what, what city kind of planners are thinking about, they're balancing all these things. They're balancing on the one hand, um, I apologize for the barking dog. On the one hand, they're balancing, trying to make things as convenient and as easy as possible, easy to understand for residents. But on the other hand, they have the real reality of like, what can I actually, um, you know, get value from, or what can I actually um, get to a recycling endpoint? Um, and those two things are not always in concert. Um, and so that is the real, the real challenge. Um, and I know, and sometimes, so it's to the point of kind of how they're rolling out food waste, I, I'm not exactly um, sure what the decisions have been there, but just um, because I can kind of imagine how they're thinking, they're probably trying to incentivize certain behaviors um, 
uh, that may seem really challenging at first, but um, probably have a lot to do with what's going on on the back end and what their the sort of compost facilities or or recycling facilities are saying to them um, in terms of what they can and cannot manage at these sites. Does that answer your question? I guess so. Hopefully. Uh, Dick Hewitson. Dick. Hi, thank you uh, for your talk. I have a question, but I'd like to make a comment before it. I grew up in the 1930s and recycling was our way of life. <laughs> yeah. when, you, when you live in poverty, you save everything and you find a use for it. And I don't know when the change happened, but it has bothered me my whole life that we live in a society that thinks everything should be thrown away. But my question is, with this COVID thing, I keep see watching these pictures on television. Are the containers for the vaccine and the syringes recyclable? That's a, that's a great question. So first I'll say to your comment, I mean, I totally, I totally agree with you and I, um, and I really appreciate the, the comment there. I think really the, it's all, it's entirely a mindset and, you know, maybe you know much better than I kind of when that mindset changed. Um, uh, but I, but in terms of the vaccine containers, I, um, that's not something we deal with specifically. Um, I'm going to imagine that components of them, yes, are, they're rigid plastic. Um, so it's kind of a, a higher grade plastic. Um, or if they are, you know, sort of there's the metal components, um, how exactly they're handled, I'm sure happens through kind of a, a bio, you know, sort of biohazard and highly trained, or I would hope, um, uh, uh, operation. And so I can't speak to like whether or not they're being recycled now. I will say that I had you know, I don't know, Dick, if, if this kind of gets to the larger issue, but when, when COVID started, I was like, oh no, like there's going to be so much low grade plastic um, that we all of a sudden are, are fighting kind of across the world um, to get access to. So if you think about like one thing we have every day is all of our core members wear face shields at the food boxing sites, which is critical to their health and safety um, because we have them operating on site, you know, like just like normal and unlike other folks that we haven't been able to kind of isolate our t um, as a team. Um, but so we have, we have to have them in um, plastic gloves and then, um, and the face shields, but you know, from a waste management perspective, there's just like not a whole lot you can do with those materials. Um, and so I do think there's an opportunity to think about, you know, when, when disposables are necessary, when we need to deploy mass amounts of resources, can we, you know, can there be more um, forward thinking about how we can make sure that these are materials that we can ultimately do something with on the other end? Because they're just really not, to my knowledge, there's really not a lot you can do with latex gloves, right, um, that have been disposed of, or um, a face shield. It's just going to become really, really low grade um, plastic. So, um, so I think in terms of the, you know, I, I unfortunately I can't answer the the, whether or not the syringes are actually being recycled, it would probably depend on the area um, and who's managing them. Um, but uh, but I think there is this bigger question of like we needed disposables to keep us safe um, in this for this past year, and so there's just a tremendous amount of really unusable material that we've pumped into the system um, that is on some level heartbreaking um, to me. And so would love to, you know, I don't know, see greater thought about that. Thank you. Uh, may I just make one other comment? Um, you're, you're, you were commenting that we have to look to how we can use things in the future. And it seems to me that a mindset would be much better if anything that's designed is designed to begin with, that it, it, that how it's going to be recycled. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think there are, um, you know, there are groups like there's the Sustainable Packaging Coalition. Um, there are a number of groups that are thinking about that, um, but it's, uh, we have a long way to go. Um, and I think it's also highly, um, highly complicated. Like compostables is one of the big ones that gets debated. So compostable cups and all that. I tend to actually be a fan of kind of going in the direction of, of compostable for, um, 
for some of our disposable materials, but there's a lot of folks who say, well, it's, even if it's compostable, it's still really hard um, to make a good compost pr product with those materials mixed in. So like theoretically, yes, it's compostable. To Carl's point, like theoretically, you know, this the box or whatever might've been made to be, um, to be managed on the other end, but whether or not regionally, they're a you're able to manage that material in sort of practically um, becomes a big, big question. So I totally agree with you, um, Dick, that, that that's where we're trying to go. That's actually what I would love to involve our core members in. Like, you know, one example is, um, could we have like, um, there's one school in Palo, school district in Palo Alto has actually um, started to roll out a program of reusables. So they have reusable clamshells and containers that they, um, that they distribute their lunches in and then they collect that, wash it, and then kind of redistribute lunches in those. It's a big, really very cool step. Um, and because those, those um, uh, reusables are made of rigid plastic that, you know, when they get to the end of their lifetime, they will, you know, they will be re recyclable to a certain extent. Um, so we are seeing cool things like sort of this redesign of systems that's happening, um, but the scale of that needs to be huge for us to, to get at the 30 million tons of waste in California and then, you know, much more across the country. Okay. Uh, Christine, Christine Hoffman. Yes, thanks. Okay. So uh, I had a few questions. So um, I guess uh, my first one it has in terms of the Bay Area, which is where you're at. And that is, um, since you said so uh, specifically like glass and these other things, which are valuable and glass, I'm also a big fan of glass that it can be turned into glass and sort of indefinitely recyclable, just like aluminum, but it, it has this component that it, that it breaks. Um, like you said, and then it becomes uh, sort of a contaminant. Have have you uh, are you working to sort of have people separate um, more on the front end before instead of like dumping all into one recycling bin? Because it sounds like your staff um, separates a lot, but um, uh, but af after sort of everyone's thrown it all into a single recycling bin, and then that poses the problem of then when it's picked up, you know, gets jostled around, and then the glass ends up breaking. But if glass went in its own um, like designated container. I'm just thinking of, uh, so for example, I lived in Germany a few years, right? They have, you could put like brown glass, they even separated the different types of glass. You have brown glass, clear glass, and green glass, right? And, and then when you put it in there, maybe the bottle shatters, but all the shards are also green glass, right? So then they're able to re recover that. Um, and then uh, my, my second question is um, sort of, in, in the Bay Area, at least, you know, we already have kind of moved to a little bit more separation of like the food, the food waste um, bin and the recycling paper and then um, other, other um, recycles. I, I can't, I, I, hopefully I got those four right. I know there's like four, um, at least in, in Sunnyvale. Um, but other um, districts in California, so for example, I lived in Merced for many years, um, and I went to, uh, with the Sierra Club, they had a presentation by the, um, someone from the landfill, um, Merced County landfill, and I was blown away by the fact that there are so many cities that don't even have curbside recycling pickup in Merced County. Like a lot, most of the cities don't, so Merced does, but sort of the surrounding cities don't. And so everything goes into the trash and all of that goes to the landfill. So even these really valuable recyclables like aluminum cans and, um, and, and everything else uh, is, going to, uh, is going to the landfill and not being okay. recovered at all. So I was wondering, do, do you have any partners in that, in, in those communities? Again, there's, uh, Merced is, is very low income. There's a lot of people I think could benefit from uh, your program. Um, I'm very interested in also getting involved in this, so I'll, I'll write to you after this, but um, but yeah, kind of just wondering if you have any partners in that area, if you're looking to expand, um, or that kind of thing. Those are my two questions, sorry. Yeah, for sure. I, so I'll, I'll take the, the first, I can I resonate strongly with your reaction because I, um, I moved here from the East Coast about a year and a half ago, and I remember thinking, um, you know, like, wow, I'm going to go work on recycling in California. Don't they have it all figured out? Like I imagine this Mecca of, you know, you hear about San Francisco and in New York, we were just, you know, totally on the, like a fun level. We were constantly competitive with our, our counterparts in, um, in San Francisco. Um, and so we would say, well, you have, the, you have the probably most successful organics collection program, but we have the largest just by sheer number of people. So, you know, anyway, um, so the, um, 
So I thought, so it was really interesting to me coming here where not only um, is, well, well, I guess what's most interesting is like how different to your point of like how different things are. And so if you think about Sunnyvale to San Jose, I mean, that's a totally different system, right? So I, you know, it, that was, it's fascinating to me now to be working in an area where you have such a patchwork of jurisdictions that have um, so many different um, systems for recycling. And I, um, and I think I imagine, you know, for, from the sort of residence perspective, you might move from one of those communities to the next pretty easily, um, whether, you know, in a given day, um, or actually like, you know, physically move your residence, um, and you would be subject to totally different rules um, in terms of what's, what you're kind of supposed to do. And like what's supposed to be recyclable yeah. and what's not. That's what people exactly. say, they, they're, yeah. they, they're confident in the recycling, but yeah, as you said, as, as you move even to the next suburb exactly. of yep. the peninsula, you might have a totally different set of rules. It's not yeah. coordinated. Yeah, and, and from a public education perspective, I think that is immensely challenging. So when you're sitting, you know, kind of in a city you, uh, sort of role thinking about, okay, how do I message to my residents or and to the people who work in my community, et cetera, um, it's really hard to say, like, to try to explain all these different sets of rules. So you're just focused on your area. Um, but, you know, that might not be in concert with how that person actually kind of interacts with the, with the geography. Um, so... I think is a huge challenge. Um, it's also just really interesting to me um, the different routes um, some cities have chosen to go. Uh, so for instance, San Jose, Sunnyvale is very much a, what we call source separated food waste and source separated materials, whereas San Jose has opted more for the mixed waste composting and kind of, you know, figure it out on the back end. And those again are trade-offs in terms of what they, what the infrastructure allows for and then also um, kind of efficiencies. So um, do you send more trucks to get um, to get different kind of um, uh, sort of pots of material, if you will, um, or do you do fewer trucks, but then you know and and separate out on the back end, but then kind of risk getting more contaminated material, or kind of be able to pull less value out of that? Um, so those are the those are the very real trade offs and thoughts that um, sort of city planners are having. Um, in terms of Merced, uh, we so we are very interested in in um, uh, we are. So we're called the San Jose Conservation Corps, but we work in San Mateo County. We work in Santa Cruz. We kind of we have a very kind of large um, sphere. Uh, we're actually kind of considering changing our name for that reason, so that people know that we operate sort of everywhere. But we're physically based in San Jose, and that's where the, the name comes from. Um, we um, though I will say that the Greater Valley Conservation Corps um, is uh, covers Merced, um, so they do do a lot of work. Uh, they are based out of Stockton, but um, do a lot of work regionally. Um, but again, they're kind of more focused on um, those four cow recycle um, uh, areas. So the e-waste, used oil, um, tires, and um, uh, beverage containers. I think there is an opportunity for, for a lot more to happen in those rural communities. And I think it just comes down to one, what state legislation is there gonna, what, what state requirements are gonna be rolled out, which there are a lot of new ones right now in the pipeline um, that will require greater consistency. So. Um, so you're going to see, hopefully, a lot of change on the sort of the level of food waste. Um, you know, in terms of, of like reaching rural communities for other um, recycling um, uh, resources, I think, um, I can't speak to Merced's situation specifically, but I do think we're thinking more about how we can get to more rural areas. I think there's a lot of actors who are thinking about how they can provide services more widely. Um, and I, I do think that... Um, that probably a big part of it is infrastructure. Like just what is the availability of, of um, and if you are collecting that material, where is it going? Um, and I think some of the, the work that Cal Recycle and, and the state legislature is doing, um, hopefully we'll get at that. There's a lot more investment being made into recycling infrastructure um, that will take some, you know, some time to kind of come to fruition because it takes a long time to build some of these facilities um, and bring them into sort of full operation. Um, but hopefully, hopefully you'll start to see more work there, but there's plenty, plenty to be done. And I think, especially in rural areas, like, I think it sounded like you're working with community groups that are working there. I think there's, there's a lot of opportunity for community, um, sort of, uh, more grassroots, um, yeah. efforts to address that in the meantime. Mm -hmm. okay, um, yeah, thanks. Glass, the question about glass, I think, so we, we specifically, that's, oh, that's sort of what, um, we, uh, specifically work with this the city participants to provide this extra free service so uh, so the businesses in Sunnyvale any business in Sunnyvale so if any of you operate or know or go to a business in Sunnyvale you can ask them if they do this um, 
anyone can sign up with us for free or free of charge to them. The city, um, actually we have a contract with the city to do this work um, where we will add an extra bin that's specifically to get at the glass um, and some other beverage container materials. Um, so it's to pull it out of, um, to really do source separation at the site um, as opposed to doing it when we get to the facility. So that's the real goal. Um, uh, is to do exactly what you were kind of referencing. We don't get down to the, we don't sort anymore um, because the sort of economics of sorting um, have really changed uh, with um, sort of the, actually the whole economics, um, uh, you, you may have heard um, kind of talk in the news about China and some of the kind of more global dynamics around recycling. That's really changed how cost effective it is. It's become a lot more expensive for us actually to operate our programs. Um, and so we don't do some of the sorting, but we are trying to do more of what kind of the Sunnyvale Glass program does, which is like have more of the sort help make it possible for more sorting to be done at the site of generation. Um, and then we can, you know, make sure that that material gets to the recycling site separately from other materials. Does that, Christine, does that answer your questions? Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, Dana and Jerry. Oh, hi, yeah. Um, this is such an interesting talk, thank you. Um, I have a question about whether uh, there are lots of incentives like at the state or the federal government to like say grocery stores, um, what kind of packaging they use for their produce, for their meat, and, and that sort of thing, so that you know you can buy products um, and not have to bring home all of that packaging. Because I spend huge amounts of time recycling things in the kitchen, and um, and I'm very concerned about it. And also, I have a question about what happens to junk mail. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I know, um, so those are two great questions. So I um, I think actually, you know, yes, there are what, so there's there's what's called um, extender, pro, extended producer responsibility um, legislation. So there's a number of laws around um, that are, that kind of um, are targeted at the, the, the producer of the material. Um, so they're required to play some role in the recyclability, whether that's kind of increasing um, the recyclability of the product itself, or um, actually um, putting together kind of associations or funds that can increase recycling on the back end. So really, um, this is not the grocery store example, but a really good example is um, the mattress recycling um, council. So uh, there's there's um, legislation that was put in place that said, okay, mattress recycling, mattresses are a huge source of landfill material. They're heavy, they're huge, they're hard to, to handle. Um, and so the producers of those mattresses need to take some responsibility for that. Um, and so the, the legislation requires that they form um, a council that then, um, that then kind of provides for the infrastructure to recycle that material. So we work very closely with the Mattress Recycling Council. So it's one I'm a little bit more familiar with to, to run our, they fund um, our uh, mattress recycling program um, that I referenced earlier. And I think that's a really nice example of kind of that extended producer responsibility. You see a lot of that around um, a variety, you know, carpets, um, just a variety of different materials. Um, and so there are, there is a lot of work um, to try and encourage more of that. You also just see a lot of partnership um, uh, between um, cities and, uh, you know, the, I referenced the Sustainable Packaging Coalition earlier. Um, but honestly, I think a lot of the pressure where you are seeing change um, is because companies believe that their consumers want that. Um, so like, for instance, you're seeing companies um, really change their packaging, not always for the better. They're, sometimes they're using the right consultants, sometimes they're not um, to try and figure out what packaging they should use. But, you know, you probably noticed or, you know, perhaps noticed that a lot of the soda companies are changing the materials that their bottles are made from. Um, you're seeing uh, just a whole kind of a whole host of change in the industry, but um, but you know there's this conversation like recycling infrastructure is so localized, and these producers produce materials for the whole country or perhaps the whole world, um, and so trying to figure out like what's recyclable in in California or, or even you know Merced versus San Francisco um, creates some of the challenges um, for making making this really work. Um, but I will say I have seen 
consumer pressure um, seems to be driving this in a big way. And so um, to the extent that, that groups like this can organize and say, um, make their voices heard to sort of the large companies of products that, that you're purchasing, um, I think that does go a long way. Um, there's also just kind of the choices like I, you know, you can make kind of, so in many cases, there are choices you can make in the grocery store that can kind of help encourage that sort of like voting with your wallet, if you will, um, which I know is much longer term and not as kind of immediately uh, gratifying. But I, I, I do see that playing a kind of almost bigger role um, than legislation in some cases, just because, um, uh, you know, the incentives, we really need to push on, on every front to incentivize this, but we need radical change, basically. Um, what was that? I'm trying to remember what the other junk um, mail, junk mail. Oh, junk mail. So there are, there are another, um, a number of, um, initiatives to like, to kind of write back to, or, or prevent junk mail. I think you can even tell the post office that you don't want certain, um, bits of junk mail, but it's, you know, that again is, um, uh, I've seen, I've seen campaigns where like jurisdictions will work with residents to write, to like write to work with the post office to say like, stop sending me this or get an immediate notification back to junk mail senders. But that's like one of those things where, um, unfortunately, I don't have a good answer for you on that. Like it's, it, it, it's like, I put it in the recycling and then try to contact some of the, um, the folks that are sending me that material, like, um, like triple A sends me so much, uh, uh, junk mail that I'm like, how do I, you know, how do I make it known to them that I really don't want any of these materials? Um, but again, I think that's the, the sort of main action that can be taken is, is to let, to let the companies know directly from you that, um, that that's a problem for you. Thank you. And I, and I have, I have something as well. Um, it's a sort of a source of frustration for me. Sometimes when I go to a place and get some food at the end of the meal, you, you've got to, uh, dispose of the, uh, stuff and, um, you know, they have, they, they're very nice enough to have these bins about a compost bin and a waste bin and so forth. But, but sometimes the materials that I've got, I can't identify which, what they are and where, therefore, what bin they go. And clearly, this is a problem for many other people because you look in those bins and they all have pretty much the same stuff. That's got to be pretty wasteful. For sure. I, I mean, I think I, the, the places that I've seen be most successful are where the ones where... Um, uh, first, they really care. So they put up really effective signage. Um, and that's sort of more rare. Um, and that they'll actually put the item. So like one thing we I used to do a lot of um, big events for recycling, and we would always put the specific items from the event on the signage so that you could see exactly not just like, not just like, hey, you figure it out, you know, but like really show folks like the, this thing that, you know, this um, taco shell boat or whatever, like that goes in this bin versus this goes in the other bin. Um, it's a huge challenge. And I, and I think that's where um, it's important that, um, that legislation require that businesses really take this on and take a kind of active role because it's not, it's sort of not only not right, but just not effective to put that on consumers who are coming in one time and interacting with your bins maybe for the first time and not won't necessarily know, did you purchase, um, like I think about this, right? Like I have this, right? Um, this is, it's hard to know, is this compostable? Is this recyclable? Is this, what is it, right? And so unless they tell you um, at their store whether or not they purchased this from a given source, then there's really no way for you to, to effectively know, right? Um, and so, um, so I think that um, really like the onus is on the businesses to, to um, create proper signage um, and education around that. And that hopefully that some of this, this legislation will um, start to drive us in that direction. And then also kind of demand from participants. One thought, one thing though, that I, um, I kind of am really interested in is like, even if you do a lot of education, it's still like, you know, it's still, I, I, I used to call it sort of like the recycling bin dance. Like I would, I would just sit and watch people interact with recycling bins in public spaces and kind of like go in this direction and then actually think about it again and go in this direction and kind of go in this direction and then just give up and just put it all in the trash or give up and put it all in one bin. Um, and I, um, I, I think like at the end of the day, what there's a lot of work that businesses could do to simplify that process just by choosing the right materials. So if you choose like a, um, 
like a boat for the mm -hmm. for the materials for the food right but then you choose a plastic top and then you choose a compostable cup but then you choose plastic silver for you know the silk forks and, and knives or whatever the disposable um, flatware um then that creates a lot of steps that you have to take as you're kind of depackaging that material and putting it in the right place. However, if, and this is where I think compostables are actually, um, and there's a lot of people that disagree with me on compostables, but where I think compostables could be really successful is if everything was compostable. Like if everything was compostable plastic and then it was okay for, for you to put everything in one bin, that would make it much easier for the participant. And then it also means that the, the, the business, which is relatively sort of a closed environment, um, could then guarantee to their recycler on the back end, like, oh, this is all compostable. So you can take it just to the compost facility. Um, so to the extent that you have those closed systems, there is an opportunity to sort of own, um, sort of kind of like figure out a system that really simplifies it and makes it kind of almost like a one bin world. You know, and then of course, if you have this situation where you can use reusables, that's always best. And I do think people are pretty good at differentiating between reusables and disposables. Um, so anyway, all that's to say is that you're totally right. And you look in the bins, it's very discouraging because you know people kind of give up at the end of that dance as I reference. Um, but there are things businesses can do if they're really thoughtful about thinking about, you know, sort of what is that what is that interaction and how can I simplify it um, that can that could go a long way. Okay, uh, thank you. I guess uh, we probably should, when we go to these places and see the problem, we ought to probably com complain to the food place. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I, I wonder if there's like a way I mean, probably there's a whole field of thought about this. But um, I, I think there's probably a way we could complain that might make it more impactful. So like saying, you know, maybe pointing them to resources or, but just definitely pointing it out and saying, Hey, you know, this is really important to me. And really I would choose to come back if you um, could work on this. Um, but then maybe also pointing them to, um, to different resources or um, organizations that could be consultants for them um, might be helpful too. Cause I, I, you know, I've pointed it out and then you just get kind of this look of like, well, what can I do? You know, I work at the cash register or whatever. Um, but if you can, if you can really get that message, to sort of the, the sort of the manager or the corporate um, overseer of the of the organization and say how important it is to you as a consumer. Um, I think that could go a long, long way. Can you point out a resource that would help? You know, that's a good question. As I was saying that, I was like, who would I who would I send you to? Okay. Um, okay. I, there's a lot of zero waste consultants in California. There's um, the the um, uh, there's an organ. The Northern California Recycling Association has a number of um, of sort of members who are um, what are called sort of zero waste certified um, consultants, and I think for sure that's a great um, a great resource is to is to look at NIC NICRA is the acronym, so Northern California Recycling Association. Um, send them there um, and see if any of the members of NICRA could could serve as like a um, a consultant or a resource for a company that's looking to make those changes. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, quickly before we go on to the next uh, uh, question, uh, sort of as, a, as an anecdote to some of the stuff you were talking about in that last question, I used to work for a large company, large tech company in the area that was famous for uh, giving everybody, you know, free food for lunch and dinner and everything. And they did the same thing. Like everything was compostable surprisingly and and it was labeled as such and they had the bins and and over the bins they had the pictures of the items that you'd put in and yeah i definitely agree that worked very well uh, it was pretty easy to tell where everything went um some parts they were a little inconsistent about but uh for the most part it worked really well so yeah putting thought into that system goes a long way yeah so we have ray the next question. Uh, you got to unmute yourself, Ray. Okay. First of all, Luis, thanks for your talk. I think that zero waste is an admirable goal. Uh, obviously, now no simple solutions. I've worked in manufacturing and product design most of my career and have a lot of experience with different things. Uh, many products are specifically designed not to be reusable or whatever, because if you make something that lasts forever, then you saturate your market and 
you dry up as a company. Whereas if you make something where you have to use it once and throw it away and buy another one, you have perpetual business. So that's, that's a problem. Uh, I've seen a lot of different recycling schemes. I worked in Antarctica where you had 15 different categories or more of where to put things so that it could all get recycled properly. And as a consumer, I am often conflicted about how much effort to put in on recycling because I don't know where my effort is going to be best spent. I think my biggest current source of recycling is food packaging. And, you know, every time you buy a frozen dinner, you get a bowl with it. And is it appropriate to wash it or just put it in recycle? Um, you know, I know you don't want to waste water either. So what, how can consumers get better information on how to recycle what they would like to be able to do to, to support the cause of zero waste? Uh, there's no good information out there. People are discouraged by, you know, knowing that they spent this time separating and sorting and cleaning their waste and then it all goes in the landfill anyway. Uh, so they give up. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I think, um, so all of that resonates really strongly with me. Um, so I think, I mean, I, I think, uh, it's not an issue that has sort of really effective mark public communication of what's actually happening. It's not something that I've, that I've seen, uh, you know, I, you know, you, you see it in some instances, but across the board, I think it's still very much they're lacking. Um, one thing that we tried to do, you know, again, I, so I worked for the city of New York um, and then I work for a nonprofit here. So I have a kind of different role here. I don't, I don't necessarily see the, the sort of policy side or, or sort of the, the decisions that jurisdictions are making, except sort of through the partnerships that we have um, at the core. But I, you know, we tried very hard to, um, to build faith in the system um, by uh, actually bringing people out to see it. Um, and so then you could ask questions about like, okay, how, how, like, how much do I really have to clean out this peanut butter jar <laughs> um, versus like, you know, is it better that I don't clean it out um, and put it in the recycling? Or if I really don't have time, should I just throw it in the trash because it's going to contaminate your system? Um, and, you know, the answer, unfortunately, and like thinking about all the places that you've lived, Ray, um, the answer, unfortunately, is so local. Um, and I think that's the really big challenge is like whether or not a locality is able um, to, to take that material and do something effective with it um, really depends on what's going on locally. And so I think the best way, if you have time, and this is like not at all equitable or not at all reasonable for most people, but is to actually go to your facility, like to get on the tour, you know, Sunnyvale, just because we partner very closely with Sunnyvale, I know that they do tours of their, in non-COVID times of their smart station. Um, and folks who are really immersed in the operations can um, can show you around and kind of um, like help you understand exactly what they take and what they don't take and why that is. Um, uh, you know, in New York, I always would say um, to, to folks like, you know, we have really substantial, I mean, state of the art um, recycling facilities. And so we can, you know, I would much rather get that peanut butter jar if there's a little residue on it um, than not get it, right? Um, However, that is a very different story for, um, for even just some neighbors, you know, some smaller towns around New York City that, as I mentioned, are kind of doing a lot of this stuff very manually, um, that literally are like selling their material by, um, by going through paper call sheets and just calling up folks who might take it. And, um, and so, so, you know, unfortunately, the answer to that is, um, is it depends on your locality. Um, but I will say, um, that like, for example, San Jose is running a, a, a campaign right now um, that's called Recycle Right. Um, there, it's pretty, a, they do a pretty good job of saying like, these are the things that we really want um, our residents to do. And you're able to really search um, by individual material. Um, but then, you know, that's not a resource that's available if you don't live in San Jose. Um, so I, I hate to give you a kind of an unsatisfying answer to that, but I think um, the way I think about it is I, I, um, I really try to kind of figure out what's going on in my jurisdiction. And then I, I also have just some materials that are like, 
like there's absolutely no way I'm not going to recycle, right? Like, so like those aluminum cans, um, the, uh, the materials that have really high value um, that I've learned over the years, then those, you know, I put a lot of effort into. And then um, to your point, like if there's, there's others that I'm really not sure, it actually can be better in some cases for your recycler, recycl recycling center if you put that in the landfill instead of in um, the recycling bin, because the sort of another big phenomenon is what's called wish cycling or what we refer to as wish cycling where um, where people where there's like this this tendency and I have it too even working in the industry like where I want to put um, materials in the recycling bin on the off chance that they might be recyclable um, but that can actually have the opposite effect of creating more contamination at the recycling facility um, so so I would say like one, call your local jurisdiction, see if they'll give you a tour, see if they'll they'll give you more insight um, into um, what's recyclable and what's not. Um, make friends, often they're really cool people who are just kind of overloaded with work and it's just a single individual or maybe a couple of individuals who are overseeing a lot of this. Um, and so, you know, um, being kind of their supporter or their, um, their sort of connected to them can actually be really awesome. Um, uh, so getting to know what's going on there. And then um, if you're not sure, um, kind of you could do general research, but then also like in some cases, as heartbreaking as it is, it might be good not to put it in the, in the recycling bin because that can act as a contaminant um, if you're really not sure. So one other follow on thought that I've had over time is that in some ways it might be more efficient to set up effective, efficient landfill mining and just put everything in landfill and then separate it there and reclaim what you can. And I think that that would make it a lot simpler for people. And also, if it was done right, you'd wind up with actual less landfill material at the end. Yeah, so there, so that's a, that's a definite school of thought um, that, that, that many, um, that especially in the 90s, there was like a big, I think in the next, there was a sort of big push for what's called mixed waste composting, um, where uh, like you'll see these like, um, uh, they're all different, but um, these systems that take basically everything, right? And then the idea is that you you run it through a series of processes, so probably what you're imagining, right? Like, so you have like the system that breaks down all of the organic material, and then you screen out um, sort of inner non-organic material. Um, and then the idea is like, in theory, you could capture um, uh, materials on the other end. So like, you know, once you've broken down, so if that material, if you run all of your trash through composting, then you break down all the, then all the organics break down, they become a material that can be screened out very fine. Then that, then sort of what's left over on top of the screen could then in theory um, go and be sorted through. Um, it is absolutely true um, that 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 there is there is sort of value to be gained on the back end, and what that eliminates on the front end is potentially, depending on how well you design your program, but potentially the number of, of trucks that are on the road. Um, it eliminates the need to spend money educating your residents. It you know there's sort of these efficiencies that appear to be gained, right? But when you actually go to these, this is where I personally, and again, I, this is really very personal. Like there's some folks who, some people who would say, well, the, the benefits of this are better. But the, pro, the when you think about really everything that goes into the waste stream, you start to get like toxic contaminants and batteries, like all types of things that shouldn't, right, be going into that waste stream. And then those are, are interacting with the materials that you're trying to sort of pull out. And so those sort of reality of um, the sort of what's the quality of what's on the back end um, really is downgraded. Um, so like the quality of your compost, for instance, is going to be very different from compost that was made um, with source, what we call source separated, so separated at the site of generation. Um, uh, and, um, you know, can you can assure this site sort of much higher quality biological product um, then you can, in my mind, if you're kind of doing it on the back end. Now, there may be room for both of those things, um, but I'm really a, a strong proponent of source separation. If we could get it right, I think we're far from getting it to the level of efficiency that we want to get. Um, but I, I think that um, uh, what I've seen at the facilities I've been to um, concerns me in terms of, um, we have a lot of work to do um, in terms of investing in our soils, um, investing in, you know, our, our plant, you know, creating these raw materials that are very high quality. Um, and uh, I, I, 
my personal belief is that we sort of take away from our ability to create those really high quality products when we do these systems. Now, there could be, you know, an invention down the line that really changes that. Um, but right now, sort of the, the status of mixed waste um, sort of management facilities, um, to me, doesn't achieve kind of the high product um, manufacturing level that we could achieve if we were, if we really were to kind of lean into source separation. Um, right. I agree that to, do, to make landfill mining effective, you would have to develop the technology and the science, the chemistry required to get quality products out. Yeah, for sure. And I, and I think, may, and maybe we need both, right? Like maybe, maybe we need to kind of have a system that's um, more varied. I'm a big proponent actually of like sort of thinking about waste. Maybe this is a kind of, cause I know it's, we get cut off at, oh, we soon. Um, I, I, I like to talk about um, how, or sort of make the comparison to um, the transportation industry. I think no one, ha everyone in our minds, you know, it's very easy um, to understand why we need bike paths and we need um, pedestrian pathways and we need um, trails, we need medium sized streets, we need super highways, we need, you know, everything in between. Um, we've really come to this um, sort of collective understanding, I think, as, as humans, um, that we want this varied infrastructure in terms of transportation. But historically, the way waste has been thought about is like, we want this to be as invisible as possible and as large scale as possible to get this out, um, like out of our sight, out of mind, um, and as far away from us as possible. Um, and and the and I think you're seeing right now in the waste industry actually a big shift kind of in the direction of where transportation is going, where you're having and I you know I didn't get into this but like you know you have your small scale composters and your large scale composters you have your mixed waste composting facilities and you have your uh, or your mixed waste management facilities. And then your um, and you know your kind of more source separated kind of single stream um, uh, efforts. Uh, and I think for us to create a resilient waste management system, um, we need to be thinking about all that. And then plus, you know, the addition of what's um, important to the core, which is you know how are we making sure that we're creating um, using this as an opportunity to create really good living wage jobs um, and bringing kind of diversity um, or sort of operating at the intersection of, of social justice and um, environmental um, sort of consciousness so that we can um, address sort of the inequalities of the waste system at the same time. So I, I totally agree with you. Like, I think there's tons of work to be done on thinking about this as like to get folks like you who have been in manufacturing for a long time to really um, dive in on this effort um, so that we can continue improving the infrastructure. Um, and then also kind of diversifying so that we can have a more resilient, um, a more resilient system that um, really helps us get to that circular economy, that image that I showed earlier. Yeah, I think this would be something to get involved in. My current focus, however, is clean energy, which I think is the top, also, yeah, also. top priority in the world right now. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And clean, so clean, at the core, we are also very interested in clean. So I talked, I spoke specifically about zero waste, but we are also very interested in um, engaging our core members in um, clean energy. Um, we do a lot of work on natural resources management and sort of a whole number of other areas. So for sure, those are critical too, um, if not more critical. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.